to me. Do you know where you are, darling? After dark, while the nation sleeps. Oh, you need users? An army of A&E medics across the UK work through the night. Sometimes you're more like a soldier than a nurse. With incredible access. During unprecedented times. All clear. Shock. We return to follow the night shift at one of Britain's major trauma centres. All the weird and the wonderful things come in at night. Jesus Christ. It's a working environment that's not for the faint-hearted. It can be very volatile. Drug abuse. Can't this Have you taken something? Alcohol abuse. Laying in your vomit. Assaults. I've got it with a very close to me. Hey! And every shift brings the risk of abuse and aggression. <laughs> Some nights we have as many police officers <laughs> as we do doctors. If you want to fight, let's go with our partner. We follow the incredible staff at Hull Royal Infirmary. Please, God, don't let me die as they battle to save lives. Seeing such traumatic injuries, unfortunately, deaths. No Beautiful. You always realise how lucky you are. Due to the current situation of the pandemic, people have reacted badly to not being able to stay with their relatives and their family in the hospital in their time of need. I've asked them to move nicely. I couldn't help giving a verbal. Yeah, there's a lot of front of it. There's three of them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think there's different types of people that some people worry about COVID and some people that just think it's not really a thing, which is a shame because it is real. There's a lot of people that, you know, they abide by the rules and they come in, but then there are the other part of the population that don't listen to those rules. He's not allowed in, because we're not allowed visitors. It's been like 18 months now, people should know what it's like, but I took a dislike to it. I've asked him a few times to leave site, and it's true still. The abuse that sometimes we do receive isn't justifiable. Uh, didn't specify what they're actually looking for. Because I thought I would be the money is literally waiting here. And like, my mum's gone in now, so we've got no left word to move on from Well, we're not into a dirty on our body, and obviously, yeah. it's yeah. a big family. It can't be helped, can it? No, but that's the reason. We understand that you're upset, and we understand that you're angry, and if that was me, I'd probably feel all of those things. But the way people speak to us sometimes is just a little bit uncalled for. <laughs> Paramedics are rushing a man into recess by ambulance after a serious car crash. I'll talk to you over here, just so I can explain to the doctor and the team what's going on today. All right. There's a lot of road traffic collisions can be quite horrific. Um, we never really know um, the true picture of what we're walking into, whether it's going to be a one patient, multiple casualties, multiple vehicles, and whether we're going to expect to see life-threatening injuries or life-changing injuries. Right, this will be traffic. It's get to your old Steve who was involved in a single vehicle collision at about 20 past 7. His car has rolled, airbags have deployed, we believe we're wearing our seatbelt. Handover is probably one of the most important things that we do and often quite underrated, um, mainly because trying to paint the picture of what we've seen and, and how the accidents occurred and how the potential for the injuries have occurred as well. A laceration to the top of our left forehead down to the skull. No loss of consciousness, he remembers the accident and he self extricated through the boot of the vehicle. His chest is clear, equal rise and fall. Pelvic is pain free and feels stable. There's no groin or thigh pain, all long bones feel intact. In a trauma, the extra things that are really important to hand over are um, the speed of the crash, whether the patient was wearing a seatbelt, um, whether airbags were deployed, um, whether the car rolled over. I've got a picture of the car, I thought you might need to see it. All of those are really important to paint a bigger picture of what's going on internally um, or potentially externally with the patient that we might not have developed whilst we've been on scene. Thanks very much. Okay, where's your main problem at the moment? Oh, yeah. 
After checking that Steve's airway is clear and working properly, Dr. Chris is examining the whole body for further injuries. Any pain on your hips? No. Coming down your leg? All okay? Yeah. Wiggle all of these toes. That's fine. Do all your feet feel like they're in the right place? Any gaps, any sharp edges, any, any missing teeth? Mm. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get you around for a scan. A CT scan is the best possible way to identify or rule out any potential injuries that a patient might have. It's that quick overview of what's going on that we can't see yet. Okay, lucky, Steve. I'd agree with that. Uh, I'll keep clicking on you later. Hello, Majors. You've got this pain in the right side of your abdomen. Which you've mentioned is worse than before. Yeah. Point to it for me. It's yeah. So it's on the right side of your abdomen. I feel really, really sick. You vomit, man. It's more gagging than vomiting. Yeah. There's nothing coming up. I've got a very high, fast heart rate. It was 197. I think it's dropped to 188. Just still too high. 47-year-old Jane has been rushed into recess with a heart rate of more than double what it should be, at 200 beats per minute. Good up there. I like it on the defib as well, because oh, okay. it just runs free. She's aware of what's going on. She's had this before, and she uh, goes into a funny rhythm where the heart beats quicker and quicker, and it becomes a bit of a, a cycle repeating itself. And what we need to do is try and stop that cycle and allow the heart to start beating again in its proper, normal rhythm. It feels like an elephant is sat on my chest and won't get off. I feel very hot, sweaty, um, out of breath. I'm very scared, that's why I was crying earlier, and the nurse asked why I was crying. And I said, partly because it hurts, but also I'm scared. I just don't know how long your heart will last. just at home making my son's birthday cake and uh, we're going to Wilson Towers on Sunday so I've made him a roller coaster cake because <laughs> that's what I do <laughs> 47 year old Jane has been rushed into recess with a racing heart rate of 200 beats per minute yeah so I didn't feel well this morning um, just thought I'd make the cake and do something relaxing <laughs> and just got suddenly worse about half one. All right. The heart's a simple pump and if it goes too quick it doesn't actually have time to fill up and therefore it becomes very inefficient as a pump and you can get symptoms of uh, lightheadedness, collapse and, and worse because you're not getting enough blood flow to all the parts of the body. So we need to intervene to, to slow it down and reset the heart. So you've had the adenosine before. Do you get many symptoms from it? If it works, brilliant. If not, we'll move on to the next step, which is knock you out and give you a little bit of a shock. Hull Royal Infirmary is a teaching hospital, and medical student Charlotte is in attendance to learn from and aid Dr. Ben. Are we good to go? Have you got the adenosine in there? OK, <laughs> always double check. The first thing that Dr. Ben and Charlotte will try is an intravenous drug pumped into the heart to slow it down. Are you happy um, how to do it? Yeah. Today's a bit different. We have a medical student who's decided to spend their elective with us in Hull. Having a, a student who's particularly keen on emergency medicine is keen to learn, and hopefully we can sort of repay that by giving us some experience uh, and see what real emergency medicine is all about. All you're trying to do is get this medication to the heart as quickly as possible, and you're good to go. When they give adenosine, you have to flush it through really quickly so that it gets to the heart um, quickly, and so that's why I've got this fancy contraption. Mm. So basically, we've got an octopus, which is a type of a cannula attached to a three-way tap, attached to a syringe, so it allows us to essentially give two substances at the same time. The worst case scenario is not pumping enough blood to various parts of the body. The patient could have a heart attack, could go into a worse rhythm, and the heart could actually stop so 
we're not quite there yet. What the medication does is basically put a block into the heart to stop it beating quite so quick and then the hope is it will restart in a more traditional and more appropriate manner. So if you just turn that so you've got them all, that's brilliant, and off we go. Okay, so you might get a weird flushing feeling and then just lock it off. And we will see what difference this makes on that ECG. And usually what happens is just when we think, oh, it's not doing anything, you do just get a little blip. And then ideally we would like to see a big blip and it go back into sinus rhythm. Have you felt anything at all? Nothing's changed. Nothing. The injection of drugs designed to slow Jane's pulse has had no effect. So Dr. Ben has to pursue a more aggressive treatment. I'm going to give the anaesthetist a ring to come and get ready to come and help. We'll have to intervene with electricity and we deliver a specific type of shock. But for that to happen, the patient needs to be unconscious because uh, it's not a very pleasant experience. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask our anaesthetic colleagues to come down and assist with us so that they can sedate the patient, keep them comfortable when we deliver a shock to restart the heart in a, an appropriate rhythm. Okay, I'll go and get things moving. All right, we'll be back in a minute. Right, so what do you need to do? You need to check in first. Last time I spoke to you, it was in there, wasn't it? Yeah. You was in there all day, weren't you? Three is a major trauma, just waiting on scan. But she's going down. Yeah. Well, we've got to do a scan. Okay, one, two, three. 38-year-old Steve was rushed in by ambulance after a car crash. He has been sent for a CT scan to assess the extent of injuries to his neck, lower back and to check for internal bleeds. So I've got the results of your scan. So other than that nasty wound on your forehead, yeah. we've found that there's just a couple of breaks in some of the bones of your neck. Don't panic. Yeah. Nothing that's going to paralyse you or cause you any problems. The rest of your body is working fine. Yeah. I would like some further opinion on those breaks as to how we manage them going forwards. Okay. Some breaks don't require any treatment. We call that conservative management. Others may have some further physiotherapy or specialist intervention as well. So I'm going to refer on to the neurosurgeons to help advise us about how we deal with these injuries. Before Steve is transferred to neurosurgery, Dr. Chris is calling a maxillofacial specialist to investigate for nerve damage. Okay. The department is under severe pressure. If anybody feels that they are not an accident or an emergency within the last 24 to 48 hours, if you want to discuss it with me, I'm more than happy to see if there's anywhere else you can go. She's stable. Yes. Right, okay. So yes. Excellent. We'll get her across then we'll, and then we'll take a handover. In recess, 23 year old Jemima has been rushed in by ambulance after a head on collision with another car. So, Jemima is 23 years old, generally fit and well, subject to asthma but no problems day to day. Quarter past five, front seat passenger of a car and into another car doing the same speed. Airbag deployed, seatbelt worn, no loss of consciousness. The paramedic handover is extremely important because we need to know all the treatments that has been given at that time and that will give us a chance to try to save that patient's life. Jemima's partner, 23-year-old Jacob, who was driving the car, has also been brought in. So this is Jacob and he's 23 years old. Um, this um, gentleman's passenger who's been brought here by an ambulance. He's um, was driver of the MX5 and um, where is he belt? All airbags have been deployed. The air ambulance has checked him over. They've got prior to we bring him in here. Pain to the um, lower right quadrant. There is bruising in the lower side. Um, long bones and pelvis is
in the most serious emergency situation as a team leader um, I'm taking all the handover or the information given by the paramedics with my goal being keeping the patients alive. Right, we've got quite extensive uh, seat belt marks across the chest. He's thin there all over the chest, there's a cracking there. Any pain here? No. This is thick. I bleed inside you, but that would actually stop. I don't think it is. However, we need to get you for a strong scan. Okay? All right, we'll get you sorted. As the doctors check over Jacob, Across the corridor, his girlfriend is being assessed for any life-changing injuries. Uh, abrasion to the right hip. Just squeezing your hips any time. Yeah, that's so much more things, right? Which side? Um, okay, right, so right. just on your skin. Yeah, yeah. If I push on the bones. The bones feel fine, yeah, but my legs feel completely fine. That's fine. Any pain in your back? Sort of, like, to my back and my shoulder. Then I start. But protein stuffs, no carbs, no bread, can die. Trying to get me to starve myself <laughs> every afternoon, every day. You look a lot better already. It's a lot more colour back in you. Paramedic Sally has come to check up on Steve, who she brought into recess after his car rolled into a ditch. It's unfortunate for a new car, we were just saying. It was a nice day in the room. We are lucky enough to be able to get a follow up or a bit of an overview um, of what injuries actually developed and then the potential and the outcome for that patient. And for us, it's a bit more peace of mind if we know that we've potentially impacted somebody's life in a positive way. Definitely at least a week on work. Yeah. Maxillofacial surgeon Lorna has been called in to clean and stitch Steve's head wound. Stephen's got a fairly deep laceration. It starts from his left eyebrow and goes up his forehead. How are you feeling in his eyebrow now? She said that I've done some bones or something in my neck. Yeah, he's fractured uh, C4 and C5. Oh, wow, yeah, don't move your neck. Yeah, that's okay. exactly what <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, It's just, just waiting for the neurosurgeon to come and look, but the, the laceration is not too bad, but it's down to bone, and I think it's uh, severed a branch of the facial nerve. Right, Steve, I'm going to disappear. Okay. I'll come check out your wall wounds when I come back. Oh, sorry. Right, <laughs> see you soon. <laughs> Usually, before I started cleaning that, I'd give you some local anaesthetic. If I give you local anaesthetic, one, I can't test the sensation once I've given it to you. Okay. And it will usually make it feel quite funny, so you won't, you won't be able to do the movements that I want to check for the nerve sensation. So I'll be really gentle, but it's going to feel sore off you. Dr Lorna will check for nerve damage, which could affect Steve's ability to move his face. I'll start away from the cut first. You'll feel better once uh, a bit cleaner anyway. Okay? I realised I was injured that side. You've just got a graze on that side, but okay. everything's going to feel heightened just because you've got, you've got pain everywhere. You need to check the nerves in the area, but there's a branch of what's called the facial nerve um, that goes up there, the temporal branch. So you need to check the sensation um, and the movements of that because it affects your eyebrows and things. Feels strange when I'm touching there? No. What about when I'm touching here? Can't really feel it on the bad side. Can't feel it on the left? Can feel I, can, it? I can feel it, but it's not as... Doesn't feel the same as no. the right. Okay, all right, fine. And then keep your head still for me, yep. but try and frown angrily like that for me. Yeah, I know it's painful. Just really go for it if you can. Okay, perfect, lovely, relax. It's definitely reduced on this side. It could be because the branch of the nerve that goes up there has been damaged, stretched, yep. bruised. Who knows? It's right down to your skull. I'm going to speak to the registrar and see if they're going to keep you for them to observe you. If they are, we'll get my team to have a look at this tomorrow. Ooh, the nerve, sorry. Shit. <laughs> Deep breaths. Yeah. Yeah, I can see a nerve. It could just be that it's just been stretched. I just need to move this bit of tissue out of the way, so just see how you get on. Is that all right? Mm. You all right? Mm. I can see your nerve and it doesn't look damaged. It's like a white strongy thing, basically. Okay. And it does look intact. Right. I think it's probably just the impact on the nerve and as I said I can actually visualise it and it looks okay so if you're happy I'll numb it up we'll stitch it back together is that alright with you? Yeah, so. Dr Lorna will now stitch the wound on Steve's face 
If the stitching is not done precisely, it can leave a large scar. I'm rather a perfectionist when it comes to stitching the face, so I always think if it was my face, I would want it done perfectly. It's so, so crucial. I always think it's, it's there for the rest of their lives and nobody wants the biggest scar ever. You're going to be numb around there for another couple of hours. As it wears off, it's probably going to start to ache and throb over that side again. You're getting a really nice black eye on that side already. <laughs> but otherwise, quite lucky. Not quite as big as uh, we should have thought. All right. He's staying in because he's got fractures of his spine, so he's going to be kept in under neurosurgery. So we'll go check on him in the morning, see how he's getting on, um, and we'll check his sensation. Um, we'll look to take his stitches out in about seven days or so. So make sure you get it on the right one. So connect yourself up. Yep. Open up to all. Earlier, mum of one Jane was brought in with a dangerously high heart rate. So we've just tried the second dose of the drug that we're using at the minute called adenosine. So we use um, a higher dose the second time round to see if that will also work to bring um, the heart rate down. In an attempt to avoid the need for anaesthesia and a shock to the heart, Dr. Ben and medical student Charlotte will try once more with a larger dose of adenosine. That made you feel a bit funny? Have you got that feeling? Yeah. Adenosine is quite notorious for giving you a feeling of what we call a sense of impending doom. A little bit teary, a little bit upset. Um, that, that happens with this drug. It can be difficult to weigh up the pros and cons of treatment sometimes, but you have to remember that everything you're doing is in the patient's best interest. How's that feeling past now? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not worked. The next thing we'll do is we get you a little bit sleepy and we'll shock it out. All right. Sorry about that. I expected it. Yeah, if it saves you having to be sedated and, and certainly if it saves you having to have the electric shock, it's certainly better. But we'll get there. If adenosine doesn't work, then we move on to the next step of treatment, which is to use um, an electrical shock, something known as cardioversion, to shock the patient's heart back into a normal rhythm. All right, won't be long now. It'll be about 10 minutes, I think, before everyone gets down. If thoughts are, the shock will work. It's then if you recover fully or if we get you in for a bed. First thing first is we've got to get your heart rate back under control. All right, and then we'll see where we go from there. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Back shortly. You feel dead as adenosine, but it gives you that feeling as though you're about to die. It just feels horrendous. It feels as though you're going. But Obviously, you know that you're coming back. <laughs> no problem, lovely. And uh, when do you get here? Five minutes. All right, see you soon. In recess, a call has come through from the Coast Guard who are bringing in a patient by helicopter. Cross there. So if you don't mind, get the team in. So this gentleman is uh, an offshore uh, wind vessel, yep. uh, about 40 miles away. Uh, and so basically, you get from the top, where they steer the boat, down to uh -huh. the sort of uh, baggage area at the back, the set yep. of stairs. So as he's been walking down those stairs, he's gone forward down and off. That's right. first, straight into the door. 38-year-old Ivanov had a serious accident whilst working on an offshore wind farm. The patient that's just been brought in, he has basically been on a ship today and fallen down some stairs, banged his head and sustained injuries that we don't really know uh, just yet. Unconscious for about two to three minutes uh, and then when he came round he had no record of grave memory at all of the event okay. that happened. And when I got there he basically complained of pain. Just well, the top of the C-spine running all the way down to the back. 
pains about six out of ten at rest, but exacerbated massively as soon as he starts moving. Okay. Uh, he's a Bulgarian national, so his uh, language. language is quite poor. So. Okay, thank you. Do a quick primary survey. Say uh, ah. Okay, what's your name? Ivanov. Ivanov. With Ivanov's limited English, it's difficult for Dr. Sinner to assess whether confusion is a result of head trauma or just the language barrier. Head pain? No? Good. No pain? There could be head injury, spinal injury and internal injuries. So we, we're going to do a full assessment and, and see where we go from there. No obvious injury to the chest, front and lateral side of the chest. But moving down, no obvious injury to the front of the abdomen or sides of the abdomen. I'm going to examine your tummy. Say yes if it is hurting, any pain, okay? Pain? Good. Pain? It's a bit okay. So slightly tender on the left lower quadrant. Pain? Fine. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, guys. He will have a CT scan, he may need to come to us in intensive care. Potentially, his injuries are life threatening, and we just don't know. There's not a lot we can do at this stage. Is it just me and you then? Hi. Okay. Yep. That's us. Oh, yeah. 23-year-old Jemima has had a CT scan after a head-on car crash. We're going to get some blood from her, going to get access, and then send her for a scan. So she's got some nasty-looking injuries to her nose and her face um, and her left shoulder. So we're just going to have a look um, at what's, what's going on with that scan. Um, and then she'll come back and we'll assess it further from there. Hello, lovely. Nice to see you. 23-year-old Jacob, Jemima's partner and driver of the car, has also had a CT scan to check for trauma injury. So a CT scan is our window inside the body. There may be subtle injuries that we need to know about straight away. So we get the right specialties to come and see the patient if they require intervention, if they require surgery, or if they require very close observation. It's our window inside. I'm Chris, I'm one of the other doctors. Okay. Okay, but I've got the results of your scan. Cool. Okay, so the good headline news is lucky. Yeah. All right, so, I mean, there's some bruising that they yeah. found, and yeah. big enough bruising to pick up on the scan, so no wonder you're uncomfortable. Yeah. But everything else, it's fine. You've escaped major injury. Okay. Jacob has been extremely lucky, but the news for Jemima is less encouraging. So I've got the results from your scan. Okay. So basically all the bits that are hurting you, we've found something. Right. Okay. All right. Obviously the left side of your face where it's all swollen and your nose, there are some breaks to your nasal bones. The left side of your cheek essentially is broken. Yeah, I can feel that. That's really pushed up. Yeah. Your left collarbone has got a break in it. So underlying that break in your collarbone, there's some bruising on the lung. Now by itself, those injuries are all, you know, they will heal. Um, um, my colleague here from the maxillofacial surgeon team has just come to you know, speak to you about the facial injuries and so on. But we do need to observe you in hospital because of the bruising on your lungs. Okay. It's a difficult balance speaking to patients when they're in uh, an emotional heightened state. You have to be honest with them, but you have to acknowledge that these are the facts about them. They want to and deserve to know everything that you're doing that there are no surprises, so they continue to trust us to look after them. Jemima will have a collarbone x-ray to check for additional breaks. Hello! 47-year-old Jane's heart rate is still twice what it should be. Got your water circuit, um, some CO2, bit of oxygen running, non-rebreath rappels if we need it. Yeah. Intubation trolley outside should we get to that stage, not expecting to yeah. shed up. You sedate them enough just for the procedure and they come out of it pretty quickly afterwards. It's normally quite a quick fix, this type of treatment, so they feel much better afterwards. The adenosine drug has failed to slow down Jane's heart, so she will now be anaesthetised and her heart electrically shocked. The side effects of any of the anaesthetic drugs that we use in these situations can be that you lower the blood pressure too much or you stop their ability to protect their own airway and you have to put breathing tubes down to protect that and take over their breathing for them. So it's just a case of trying to get the balance right. So I'm going to drop the bed down a little bit. I'm going to 
start giving you some other oxygen to breathe as well through this mask, okay? And that up your nose is going to go really fast. Right. Right. Four nice, really deep breaths in and out for me, all the way to the bottom of your lungs. Well done, you. With Jane anaesthetised, the electric shock to her heart can be given. Okay, do you want to charge? Charging. You might want to check a pulse yourself, see if you can feel one. Lovely, nice, strong central pulse. When they go nice and smoothly like that, they're absolutely mm -hmm. fine. It's just making sure you're prepared for what that does. Yeah. All right, all finished. Hello. All right. Three, two, one, you're back in the room. <laughs> you're all done. Yeah, it's back to normal. This young lady here has just put your heart back into the room. A bit of help. I chose to train to be a doctor because I think it's amazing to be able to help people out when they're no longer in a position to be able to help themselves is just the most fulfilling feeling. Thank you very much. Gotcha. We're going to let you rest for a bit, OK, before we do anything else. Just give you a chance to come round properly. Everything's absolutely fine. All your observations are totally normal, OK? I'm just going to go and scribble in your notes, but I'll pop back in before I disappear off. Just check you're all right, all right? Say again. Yeah, just one shock. Same energy as last time. The cardio mission went really well. It was nerve wracking. I've never seen one done before, so let alone do one. So it was, it was obviously a really good experience for me to learn how to do one. So Jane's now in a nice, um, normal heart rhythm, slowed down to a good rate, and she's just recovering from the sedation that she was put under for us to be able to do that. How are you feeling? I'm good. I've just been on the phone with the cardiology registrar, who is happy for you to go home with a plan. Yeah. And obviously any problems, he's calling where we are. Would you like anything at the minute? Do you feel like drinking or eating anything? Cup of tea. How'd you have it? Milk, sugar? No. No sugar. <laughs> tea is a really important entity in hospitals. I think it has some kind of magical healing power and I personally couldn't get it through. A night shift without it. Go careful because it's really hot. Just thinking, shall I put anything else? Look, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I feel a lot better. I don't feel. I feel tired. Really tired. I could sleep for England. I feel so much better. No elephant fat my chest. No breathlessness. All gone. Magic. Yeah, really pleased. They did their job, looks great. <laughs> One person in front of you. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. In minors, 52-year-old Pam has injured a leg falling onto a coffee table at home. It's been a long time since I've been in a hospital. Oh, I've still got stuff. I've put straight in my leg. Always bashing yourself. The skin's that thing, right? One look, I'm like a lump of liver. Ooh. Seriously. All right, you take care, mate. All right. Okay. Nice to meet you, Pamela. Any doctors here? Nice to meet you. Pamela. Pa Pam. Pam. Tell me the story, Pam. What's happened? I've got really thin skin, and all I did was knock it on the coffee table. Mm -hmm. What um, time? What time? It'd have been about half an hour. How did you do? Were you walking? Just on trip? I was only walking. The paramedics put this on. Yeah. Was it bleeding very heavily? Yes. Did you have medical problems at all? Yeah. My skin is so thin. I've been having blood tests and everything, and nobody's come up without. Are you on any blood thinning medications? No. Nope. You feel me when you touch your foot there? Yeah, I feel it. Yeah. Have you had anything to drink this evening? I've had a drink yet. What have you had? I've had a few cancer sides. Okay. Right, 
I can't help but look at it. Yeah. But I don't want to. Oh, God. When you see really gruesome injuries, um, any gory scenes in A and E, um, it can be quite shocking. Ah! Oh, the hell? That's quite a wound there. Ah! No, no, no. After banging her leg on a coffee table, 52-year-old Pam is in minors, having a serious wound examined by Dr. Theo. Sometimes you can clearly see how much pain the patient might be in. The way that I've learned to deal with it is to sort of medicalize the, the issue. So if you just think about how you need to treat and manage a wound, then it helps to depersonalize the problem. So I can just put a bit of numbing agent around there so we can have a bit more of a press, OK? Oh, God. Do you have any allergies at all? Bloody insect bite. Insect bite? <laughs> yeah. But then they got to give you the nose. Okay, just tuck your leg. Oh. Mm. 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 Just tuck that numbing agent on the side of here, okay? You want to sting a bit, okay? Oh, oh, It's sometimes difficult to deal with patients in pain um, psychologically and because sometimes people are in very severe pain when they come to A&E. But it just involves frequent reassessment to help get on top of the patient's pain. You did really well done. <laughs> oh my god. I'm gonna have to get rid of my coffee table. Thank you, you're doing really well. And you can guarantee every time I do my legs in, I always end up with infected legs. The last one I had to have three courses of antibiotics. If a wound in a leg becomes infected, it can go from just simple infections at the wound site um, to the most serious examples such as sepsis and death, as well as some chronic illnesses and ulcers in the leg if not treated early. Oh, oh. Oh, very well. Ah. Where is it hurting? Everywhere around that area. It's dropping, it's absolutely dropping. Oh. What are you doing? Oh. I know you're just doing your best. Yeah. <sighs> OK. It looks a bit too deep for me to sort out right today. So what we usually do for that is I'm just going to pop a dressing on it and then I wrap it up. And then if you come back in the morning to the first floor, you can go to Plastic Trauma Clinic. And they'll, they'll close that wound properly for us, okay? Can you make all that down for me? Of course, or yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to <laughs> Bit of a on here, isn't it? Ooh. Well done. So you pop yourself out, and then we'll get you home, okay? Thank you. Cheers. Oh, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Pamela came in with a pre-tibial laceration of her left leg. I wasn't expecting it to be quite as deep as that, and you could definitely see all the underlying tissues, including the bone. So uh, I was planning just to give it simple closure, but I think we have to do something a bit further with the plastics team. Bye bye, thank you. Hello, Major. Have you got a room we can just use to get like another two Yeah. Room. Which one do you want? Then? One of them. Okay. One, two, three. 38-year-old Ivanov is having a CT scan. He was rushed in by rescue helicopter after a fall while working on a wind farm. Was this wind turbine guy? Yeah, a little bit of neck pain and a bit of leg pain. He came down the big flight of stairs and banged his head on the big door in front of him. Because of that limited information, a language barrier, not very clear history, we decided to have a full trauma CT, i.e. scanning from top of the head all the way down to the pelvis, and that's the gold standard practice for any kind of trauma patient. Okay, sweetheart, just going to start the injection, warm feeling coming up. Otherwise, we'll be good. Okay, we're going to start the injection. Okay, we're going to Hello, sir. How are you doing? 
better. Okay, good. Good news is that we have a scan you from here all the way down to your pelvis. Okay, and have the scan been reported by the radiology consultant. They cannot see any evidence of the brain injury. Your spine from here all the way down here is okay. Your chest is okay. Everything has been reported normal. Also, we have done some blood tests. They all came back normal. So putting two and two together is unlikely for you to have any serious injury. You possibly had a degree of concussion because you bang your head. So next thing to do, I'm going to get rid of this hardboard, okay? Right, let's get rid of this first. Keep your head nice and steady, sir. Hold on, hold on. Don't rush, don't rush. Luckily, his CT was reported no evidence of any serious injury to his head, to his spine, to his chest or abdomen or pelvis. Uh, his blood test, basic blood test, kidney function, liver function, everything came back normal. Yeah. Your bed is coming up, okay? Don't rush to, st to sit up because you may feel a bit dizzy. Well, we'll come back and ask the nurse to check your obs again. If the things are okay, have you got somewhere to stay? Or can you book a hotel or something like that? We live in, in the ship. Uh -huh. uh, in the, we, in the so you live in, in the ship? In, in the wind farm area. Wind farm, so, so you, don't, you don't come to shore, no. you just stay in the ship. Okay, that makes things a bit complicated. This gentleman, he didn't have anywhere to go. His current residence is in a ship in the middle of North Sea, 80 miles in the middle of the ocean. So for that reason, considering that he had a trauma, he had a head injury, he was reported he has lost his conscience, I decided to give him just for observation and a bit of pain control. And then tomorrow when he's up and about and feeling better, we hopefully can be discharging him and he can contact his crew and then arrange for his transport back to his ship. I'll be back to you shortly. Thank you. Thank you. 23-year-old Jemima, who was brought in following a head-on car crash, is waiting for the results from her latest scan. Do you know what happened? She was in a car crash and yeah. she's helicoptered in. But there wasn't a helicopter then, was that the ambulance? Ambulance. Oh, well, that was Jacob making it sound. <laughs> I think he was just panicking yeah. and didn't really fully see what I was... You know, he was being looked after himself. Yeah. Didn't really see where I'd disappeared to. Yeah. Her boyfriend and driver of the car has been given the all clear and been allowed to travel home. A few injuries, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm fine. I will be okay. Yeah. Mm. So we're going to keep overnight to observe. Yeah. yeah. And, and then they're going to review everything in the morning and yeah. then arrange follow up closer to home. We're going to put up this holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I booked this week off. I was so desperate for it. Yeah. This is the first thing that happens. When a patient is able to make a, a recovery or is able to go on to specialist care and then make a full recovery, that's what we've trained for. When you hear that that's happened or when you see them leaving the hospital, that's, that's a marvellous feeling. It really is what we've trained for. <laughs> I, saw, I saw my slider in the hedge on the other side of the road and went to one of the blokes and was like, can you just pass us that slider? Oh, no, no. Next time. When the red phone goes, that phone's ringing for a reason. Someone's in distress. Someone needs your help. Watch it. Oh, watch that wrist. Watch that wrist. Please make it stop. And if you or someone you know has been affected by anything you've seen tonight, organisations offering support can be found at channel5.com slash helplines. Next tonight, Ambulance Code Red.